addiction. I think every one of those, for the most part, in one way or another, made you feel like, yeah, I've heard that at a celebration, or, or it makes me feel good, or I, like the song says, I just feel good. So, how do you celebrate? Do you celebrate like this guy? <laughs> that how you celebrate? Do you celebrate like these guys? This guy? Maybe you don't show it. <laughs> Here's a confetti. That's my favorite one. I saw it last What about these guys? Is that how you celebrate? No? Oh, this one. So, yes, I do have a little bit of time on my hands. But there's one more. What about this one? Are you like these ones? Oh my goodness! We won! <laughs> Celebrate. We're going to be in Psalms uh, 126 this morning. We're talking about a time of celebration, a time where things come together. You don't think that you're going to make it, and God pulls you back in. And how do you respond? So, in Psalms 126, it's written like this. I'm going to have to look. I'm going to cut. When the Lord brought back the exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter, and we sang for joy. And the other nations said, what amazing things the Lord has done to them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go and plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. Could you imagine? you, you got to remember how they are, are singing these songs as they're going back in for Passover and other feasts. What a cool moment as you're just going back and you're, you're taking this long road trip back to, you know, your glory land. You're going to the temple. You're going to, to worship. And you remember things like this. Do you remember our people were exiled? They were taken away from what was ours because of, you know, multiple reasons. God even chose to exile them at one point so that they could be brought back and understand who God is. But, but think about it. You are walking back in to Jerusalem, and you're singing the song. Remember, you remember, you remember that when when God brought back His people, the joy that we were filled with. And it got me starting to think about us. We as people, and our journey is a little bit different. We're stuck here in, in this earth, in this world that is full of, of sin and it's full of, of just things that are going wrong. And you look at the news and you wonder, why did I turn on the news? Because it's full of awful stuff. People getting killed or bad things happening or, you know something in Stockton went down again. We always have something that's on the news that brings us down, and we go, man, we're just kind of here. But God has this great promise for us, too, and it's not that we were meant to be here. We, even though we're following him, we're not exiled out of our country for other reasons, even though some people currently feel that way because they're being oppressed and they're trying to flee from all of that. But we, we are almost have this feeling of exile of not being in God's presence. And he will soon call all of us home too. Home to the sky and, and to be in heaven with him. And we can say things like, when we're there, it was like a dream. I've always thought about what it would be like to come home. I always thought about what it would be like to be back in the presence of where I know I'm supposed to be. And, and when we get there, could you imagine the amount of joy, the amount of laughter, the songs that will be sung, the praise that will be given. And I know how I felt when I listened to some of our songs that were given and made me want to move and smile and, and share that with people. Can you imagine when we're all pulled back together, that joy, that song, that praise that we will not just be giving, but we will be doing together in awe and in worship with our Lord, and then everybody can say, what amazing things the Lord has done for us. For many of us, we can say we don't deserve that, all of us, actually. 
and we, we will never be able to earn it. But what a great present the Lord gives us. It reminds me of a story, and if you want to uh, come with me on this, a story of somebody who had reasons to rejoice, and it wasn't definitely was not because of what they had done. And so if you can go with me, we're going to go to uh, Luke chapter 15, and verse 17 through, through 21. And we're going to catch up in verse 17, but, but to catch us up there, we're going to be talking about the prodigal son. The prodigal son went to his father, and he said, Dad, I need my inheritance. I just need to get out of here. I know what's best for me, and I need to go experience some life away from you. And his father did it. And he knew that his son was probably going to get himself in trouble, that his son was probably going to have to go through some things that he wasn't ready for. But he still gave him his inheritance on his side and said, go for it. What we understand later is his dad also waited for him every day, hoping that he would come home. And so, in, chapter, in verse uh, 17, it says, When he finally came to his senses, after he had squandered all of his money on bad friends, because they weren't really friends, on, on women, and partying, and pretending like he fit in, in this world that his dad had taught him his whole life, that you didn't belong to, he finally came to his senses as he was sitting in the slop pile feeding pigs. Finally came to his senses and he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with the feast. For this son of mine was dead, and he has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. And meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. He returned home, and he heard the music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of his servants, What's going on? Your brother is back, he was told. And your father killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. So the interesting thing for us is, man, think about this celebration. You screwed up, and you're out, and you're wandering around, and you're lost. And the only thing you can think about is, it sure would be good to go home. It sure would be good to go home. I'm going to have to humble myself before Dad and just, I, I don't even mind living in the barn if that's what he wants me to do. But I need to go home. I've been working with... Um, one of my, my former youth group kids who, uh, Renee and I kind of took on as, as one of our own because he kind of grew up in a rough stretch with his parents and all the things in his life that were going on. So we would take him to our house to show him what, I don't want to say normal, because I don't know if we're normal so much, but what a, what a healthy uh, a marriage and family can do. And, and we'd feed him and, and we would just hang out and help him with homework or whatever. And uh, so now he's older and married, which is weird. And he's having struggles, and he's living away, and, and he's getting into a lot of different things. And I said, I think you just need to come home. There's, a, there's this hope of home that, that restores a sense of, of comfort, a sense of celebration. Um, earlier in our series about Songs for Road, I talked about one of our uh, older members at Roseville before I came here, and, and he served in uh, World War II, and he was infantry. Uh, how he made them buy him a ticket back because they only buy infantry guys one-way tickets when they were going to war because their lifespan was like 12 minutes. And he said what really got him to fight through all of it and to make it back was the thoughts of home. The, th the thoughts of being embraced. The thoughts of your parents who are, are worried about you. And, and he had, uh, was going to get married. The thoughts of his future wife. The things that drove him 
and motivated him to want to be alive was thoughts of home. And the wonder for us, as we're going through our world, and we're going through each step that this, this life has to offer, are we motivated by our thoughts of home? Not home of, I get to go back after this and take my Sunday nap on my couch because it's comfortable, but our forever home of eternity. Am I motivated by knowing that God is waiting on the porch, sitting by the fence of the entrance of heaven, waiting to run to me as I'm walking in, to put his arms around me, to put a robe around me and a ring on my finger and say it's time for that feast that we've been waiting for. Does that motivate us to live a life here? See, the older brother in this story thought that he was doing all the right things too. And he gets a little upset as we continued on and he, he starts to get frustrated at his dad and say, how, are you, how, how dare you throw a party for this one? He embarrassed you. He embarrassed our name. He went out and did all these bad things and lost all of his money, but, but you celebrate him when I've been doing everything right? What about me? I hope that we don't get to this point because we think that we've already arrived home. One of the things about this brother that I worry about for us is I don't want us to get too comfortable being here. Because this isn't home. We have a lot more calling us to better things. And when we get comfortable here, we start to compare. And we start to, to bring in worldly stuff to make us feel better about being here. So my hope for us is on our journey for this ultimate road trip and the songs that we put in our ears that motivate us through, that we have songs playing through our heads like, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. If heaven beckons me to that open, what is it? And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You know, we have these kind of songs that we sing, and, and we, we sing songs every week, and I don't even know if we listen to the words of it, because the words of these songs should inspire us to be home. That's what they're for. Last week we talked about these this, this songs of being grateful, and we, we sang the second verse of, of um, It Is Well With My Soul, and this is my ultimate song for the road that motivates me, because it tells me that my sins Oh, the bliss of a glorious thought are nailed to the cross, and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord. Do you have these thoughts? When you sing these songs, do you still get those weird goosebumps that make you realize how important these songs are that motivate us? There's newer ones, too. You know, we sing the song that says, Here I am to worship. And, and the bridge of this song says, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sins upon a cross. And we start to think about a promise of a call home, a promise of, of John 3.16. Before, we even, before they even know that, that Jesus is going to go on a cross, it says, God loved us, that he gave his only son, that if we just believe in him, we won't perish, but we'll have eternal life. His plans were, were for us from the beginning, that he desperately wants you to come home so that he can throw a party, so that he can be one of those celebrating pictures up on the screen that is excited that he made it, because he knows that some of us may not. And that's a sad statement, but I hope and I pray that we can be like this son, that when we get stuck in our moments where we are so wrapped up in ourselves that we come to our senses, and that we say, I can still go home. I have a father who is gracious. Jesus, before he left his disciples, he told them, hey, I'll be back, but I'm preparing a room for you. My father's house is a big house with lots of rooms, and it has a great big table with a lot of food, ready to have a feast for each and every one of you. And I hope that we believe that. And I hope that we long for that. And I hope that we cherish a moment to be with our Father. 
So there are a couple other parables that Jesus gave us about times to celebrate. One was about a shepherd that leaves his sheep to find the one. He will leave his 99 to find the one. And when he goes out and finds it, he's so excited, he throws it on his shoulders, he runs back and he tells all of his other shepherd buddies, let's have a party. Found the lost one. And then he talks about a woman who loses a coin in her house and she tears everything apart, and sweeps through the whole house and finds the coin and says, hey everybody, I found it. Let's have a party. And he ends both of those with, and that is nothing compared to what heaven will do when one sinner repents and comes back home. We had an experience like this for us. We were at a friend's house whose house was not so tidy. Renee bumped into a wall and her diamond came out of her wedding ring. And I will tell you this, there is no way that we should have ever found that ring. And we didn't because of the house, I'm telling you. When I say not so tidy, <laughs> it was not so tidy. <laughs> when we swept, somebody came home and said, hey, what'd you do to the kitchen? Did you sweep? That's how you know it was not so tidy. But almost a, a month later, we get a phone call and uh, my friend says, hey, uh, I gotta tell you something crazy. And I had no idea. I was thinking he was gonna share some weird story with me because he's one of my buddies from college. He goes, no. I think I might have found your diamond. I was vacuuming and my mind blew up. I was like, you were vacuuming? He <laughs> says, I stepped on something that might be a diamond. I would take a picture and send it to you. And I was like, oh my goodness, it was. We were so excited because we found something that we written off as lost forever. And I know how much I spent on that ring when I had zero dollars because I was poor and I wanted to make sure that my wife had a good ring. And so I was like, oh, we'll figure it out. You deserve a bigger one anyways now. You put up with me. But we were about to go buy one, a new one to put on her ring and we get a phone call. And we were ecstatic because something that was lost forever that meant a lot to us was found. And it was put back in its place. And I think, man, why don't we get so excited when somebody walks through that door that we would normally go, ugh. We should be like, wow, God, it's so good. Somebody needs to know the Lord and they are here. Or when we're out and about and we have an opportunity to share that message that we should be excited because we are on board of bringing people out of the ditch and the muck and bringing them home together. That we can come together and celebrate a life that was lost, that is saved. That's our mission, and it's our goal, and it's our promise. And that every time that one of those things happen and a body gets put in the water and we pull them out and they are a saved believer, the heavens are rejoicing and celebrating that one that was lost forever, that was dead, is alive and is saved. And James Brown is dancing and singing, I feel good, and Celebrate Good Times is playing in the background. And everybody is saying, it's time for a party, confetti's flying. That one straight-faced guy is still celebrating on the inside. And this is what is called for us each day. And it's our prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Then, Father, Lord, you're an amazing and awesome God, and I'm so grateful that you have patience with me. That even when I'm struggling to be stuck in my own ways, stuck in my pride, and stuck in my, my own pity parties, God, that you have patience with me, and that you help me come to the realization that I need to be homeward bound. That even when I feel like I'm lost, that if I just look to you for direction to come back home, that you're waiting to receive me. And God, I hope that we never get to a point that we feel that we've done too much, that, that you don't want us to be around you that you don't want us in your presence because we know that you are a gracious and loving God. But there are consequences too, and I just pray that we find you and that when we do, we don't let go, but instead we celebrate the fact that we were lost and we we're found, that you are our God and there is no other. God, we thank you, and we pray that you continue to show favor on us and, and forgive us when we're in our wrong and work through the sin that we're struggling with. And God, I pray that you give us the best soundtrack that gives us the, the greatest motivation and direction on our path to you on this lifelong road trip that we're on, God, so that we can find our forever home in you. We praise in your son's name. Amen.